Tim Marzullo and I spent a lot of time, you know, thinking about the brain. Uh, and in fact, we we had to dedicate about for me about six years of my life uh, just to get access to the tools to understand how my brain worked. Right. So in uh, I did research at a, uh, a major university, uh, and the tools that we use cost about forty thousand dollars. It's, it's a it's a lot of money, uh, but we would use that to kind of peer in and understand uh, how uh, the brain sort of gives rise to behaviors. And how does the how does the internal communication work? Right. You know, one out of five people—that's twenty percent of the entire world—has a neurological disorder, and there are no cures for these diseases. Right. You probably have some friends and relatives that may suffer from maybe dementia depression, uh, various uh, debilitating diseases, right? And there's no cures. Uh, yet the only way to get people interested in studying the brain is to, you know, dedicate your life and, you know, spend, you know, four to six years in a, in toiling away in your PI's lab to get access to tools, right? Uh, that didn't seem quite fair. Uh, and in fact, uh, in other areas of science, for example, in, a, in astronomy, you don't have to get a PhD in astrophysics uh, to get access to the tools, right? You can just go buy a cheap telescope uh, and maybe right away uh, become you know, in love with the idea of science or maybe in astronomy and want to dedicate your life to do that, right? Uh, but there was nothing like that within uh, within biology in general, uh, but in neuroscience in particular, there was no kind of cheap telescope uh, for the brain, right? So that's uh, what we decided to do. We did a uh, sort of a, uh, internal challenge to kind of uh, develop a, a low cost instrument of our, our giant lab equipment. And we ended up creating something we call the, the spiker box. It's something that looks like uh, this right here. And it's it's sort of like a, a telescope, uh, but for the brain, instead of looking at outer space, you're gonna look at inner space, right? You're gonna be able to try to understand how do uh, the cells of the brain give rise to behaviors. And we're hoping that, you know, just like what happened in the computer revolution, where you now have like you know miniaturized cell phones and, and this type of stuff, uh, where we'll do that in the future, we can just say, oh man, you know, I used to have uh, Alzheimer's, but I took this pill and now it's gone, right? So that's that's where we're getting at, and so that's what the um, the goal of our of our uh, book here is to sort of get people familiar with the brain, uh, and then familiar with how to do experiments, how do you do uh, controls, how do you how do you actually uh, quantify that, how do you form hypotheses, this type of stuff is what we want the everyday citizen to be able to do in biology and in neuroscience. What I'd like to do now is to do some experiments uh, to record this stuff. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to not record from my brain, uh, which I could do. Um, if I were to put a a couple of holes in my head, I would be able then to record from my brain, but I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna use what's called a stand-in or an animal model. And what I have here are a bunch of uh, South American cockroaches. The poor cockroach is well hated, right? Everyone doesn't like the cockroach, uh, but I'm here to rescue the cockroach and to remind you that the cockroaches are very similar to us. And so if you were to slice open a brain of a human and slice open a brain of a cockroach and put them under a microscope, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. The only thing that's different is the number of cells, right? So they have about a million cells. we got about 100 billion cells, right? So it's uh, it's just a sheer number thing. But the individual cells themselves are very similar to each other. So that's, that's what makes it a really exciting um, animal model because we can then learn about ourselves by using the cockroach. Even though the brain is sitting over there, it doesn't know this. These neurons are still alive and they're functioning and they're gonna keep sending messages uh, about touch information, okay? And if you can hear something right now, that sounds like pops, like a little crackling sound. And those sounds are neurons. So as I touch this hair, you hear that? What's that? So, you know, we are careful scientists here at Google Talks, so we're gonna try to investigate this. I'm gonna open up our, uh, our little device here, and so we can see that as I touch it lightly, you get a handful of them. If I touch it a little bit harder, you get more of those, and so if I touch it even harder, you get more of those. And this works not just with our eyes, uh, sorry, with our, with our uh, touch sensors, right? But we have uh, a bunch of experiments that look at this with vision, and we look at within, you know, uh, smells and all these other things that do as soon as it hits the, the photoreceptor as soon as it hits the chemoreceptor in your nose or in your ear another another hair cell just like this one it immediately converts it into spikes and those spikes are get sent throughout the brain and it does uh, this process called consciousness which we're not 
quite sure about how that works yet, but we're sort of sorting it out. Um, but then eventually comes back down to your muscles in the form of spikes in which you allows your muscles to move around and interact. Uh, I have to disconnect the cockroach and connect me. So when I do that, so now we can see these are the neurons in my spinal cord that they're synapsing on that on those muscle fibers. And we can do the same trick here. We can look in and see what those signals look like. I'm going to average it a few times. When you do that, you look at that. That's a spike, right? You got sodium, potassium returning back down to baseline again. So now that we have this, we can do a bunch of other things, right? So we can uh, see what happens to build kind of real world scenarios. Let's say you want to build a, a neural prosthetic. So here's a, a servo uh, we've built with some strings on it. And so what we can do is connect this guy to here. Let's see. And then, okay. So now when I squeeze my hand, you, know, you get another hand that does it. And you can imagine where this goes from here, right? So if, once you get connections to the to the muscles, uh, the output of the electrical activity of the brain's control of those muscles, then you can have it start controlling other things in the room. If a fifth grader can do it, uh, then anybody can do it, right? And so we try to make the experiments to such a way that that, uh, that a person with you know fifth grade education be able to do these experiments. And some of these are really advanced. You know, they're they're kind of uh, kind of cutting edge experiments that are going on. We do micro stimulation studies. We look at you know, even even things like optogenetics and, and uh, these neural neural prosthetics, which are still like uh, cutting edge research things. And we even tried to set it up so that when you uh, when you're done reading, and you're like, there's so much unknown about the brain. Like when you're done reading a chapter, there's always open ended questions, and some of them don't even have answers, right? So like, uh, so just trying to get people's ideas of how how do you take a large problem like studying the brain and bring it down to small enough chunks that you're able to make some progress into it is kind of what we're going for. The great thing about the <laughs> we working with like younger kids, which we tend to do, yeah. Uh, if you if you listen to them, they have they have got so many good advice, like, like ideas uh, for future experiments, and then I like like they don't know what they don't know, and most yeah. people don't, right? And so and but the difference I think is that they that these younger students are not afraid to shout something out that they don't know about, right? So like. That's what kind of drove the idea of writing this book is, is trying to get more of those ideas out there. And we, we have an open call for people to come back with ideas because I think uh, and that's just one of many examples. Even the idea of putting in your cell phone came from a student. Like, I don't want it on a computer on my phone. You know, it's like tons of ideas are coming back. It's, it's uh, and, and you don't find many people that are not interested in the brain or want to talk about it. So I think it's a it's 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 if you listen, you get some good ideas. You know, there's all these like um, philosophical questions like. Uh, what does the brain do? Does the brain, the brain, the brain is trying to predict, right? So it, it, that's exactly what's doing. Well, well, if it's trying to predict, then why don't you go into a dark room, and you can always predict what's going on next. Nothing's going to happen, right? So it doesn't just predict. So it's predicted for a reason. Um, but no, I do think that the brain do, doesn't need it because if you, you can, you can close your eyes, you can imagine, right? So uh, this idea of consciousness is a bunch of different theories that are out there. Um, the one I like is the uh, the attention schema, uh, which is basically claiming that um, it's just a sketch of your attention that's going on right now. That's what your awareness is. And so what's cool about that is that it could be outwardly focused. You'd be focusing on things outside, getting stimuli, but you could also kind of turn around and look inwards, right? You could do, you can sort of imagine. And so a lot of the things that we do in our brain is like, uh, as we're at, and that's what's kind of exciting about what's happening with uh, the AI reference happening out with these like convolutional neural networks, all oh, the brains are kind of like, I guess you builds up, you build these models. But I do think that the most of the motor cortex, or sorry, the cerebral cortex is model building, right? And so some of these models are models of your body, uh, look up your body schema. And so you can imagine without, without like laying in bed at night, you know, getting up and doing something, right? Or you can also imagine uh, what you could be thinking. And so that's your model of attention that you're working on. Everything I talked about today, even, even the stuff in the lab afterwards, it's all done with animals, right? So this is, um, and, and it, it's important to have that discussion about ethics. And so when, and that's what I don't like about like when you give like a TED talk, you only have six minutes or 10 minutes, to, you, you don't get all this. And so I like this little bit longer format, you can do that. Um, so that's been one of the biggest challenges is trying to uh, explain that idea of that, that benefit reward ratio and how do you, how do you ethically do it? And so, 
know, for example, when you're like, do, does do insects feel pain? I suspect they do. I mean, I don't know. There's like they have nociceptors, right? So, um, so if they do, then you should treat them with respect, and that's why we're anesthetizing the cockroach, which is still here. <laughs> uh, so, getting that message across, and in uh, what I found is that uh, people get very angry about this, but the people, but I've never had people get angry when you're in a discussion where you're having a logical discussion about why you're doing it with the ethics of, and then all of our stuff is, you know, reviewed through an IRB, an independent ethical review board. But when you have that discussion logically and, and sort of uh, ethically, uh, we never get much pushback, but that has been an issue. Uh, it continues to be an issue. And so, uh, but I think it's important if we, uh, to be able to protect our loved ones and trying to understand how the brain works is that we have to continue to use it. That hopefully one day, uh, maybe within my lifetime, I know, depending on how far these AI models have seem to be kind of exponentially growing in, in their complexity. Maybe through, uh, you know, in, in 25 years, I'll look back like, oh, I can't believe we're doing that with insects. But like uh, where I'm sitting right now in 2022, that's not the case. We don't know that much about the brain. And so we can't use models yet. So we have to be able to actually use the real thing. So that's been the biggest kind of pushback we've had. And, we're and like, uh, that was the lo longest chapter it took to write the book is about that ethic. That's, I, I really want to make sure that people understand that, that it's these, these are living, you know, I think that they're probably aware uh, beings and we need to treat them with respect. Uh, but we also need to look at the broader picture and try to get, handle that as well. So being able to handle both those things is a, it's a complex thing. And that's been the hardest thing for me to sort of get across. I'm more excited about getting it out into it, just building the tools and get them in other people's hands. Because I think, you know, I, I think we're creative, but I, I know that other people are much more creative than us. And I'm just excited to see what they come up with.